I'm so excited all the time. I can't sleep. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. At the moment. So there's so much going on that I just since America, I just had this. It was just such a dream. Amazing event that I'm all like my brain is just what next? What next? Come on. <laughs> when, when did that wrap up? Uh, 15th of November. And you're still buzzing. Oh, well, yeah, because now I'm going to do a tour of Australia, Canada, running against Keir Starmer, uh, going to Vienna, Geneva, mm, everywhere. Mm. <laughs> what in your past prepared you for this the most? I don't know. I was kind of born relatively defiant, like, and late and only did things that I wanted. So... I, I know you kids call it Legos, um, but I hoovered up. I, when, I was so lazy and didn't like tidying up that I I hoovered up my Lego when I was about two instead of putting it away. So I'm, yeah, I've always, I love debate. I smile all the way through it. The more challenging, the better. Um, so that really. What does hoovering a Lego mean? I'm oh, not... I'm so sorry. Vacuuming <laughs> oh, okay. Legos. Pieces of Lego, <laughs> I would call Lego that you would call Legos. Yeah, so yeah, okay. vacuuming. So Hoover is a brand. It's a bit like sellotape and whatever. So I remember we, most people it's call a it vacuum. Hoover. I thought it was the, I first thought it was the dam or, or the, the, the American politician <laughs> from the Gilded Age. The last time I told, told an American, I did say vacuuming and I did say Legos. So, sorry. I thought you were more au fait with English. I'm, I'm, I'm catching up. I'm always a few steps behind you Brits and mm. um, along many vectors. So what was the thing that you did in America? It had a fancy name and there was pictures all over the place, but... It was called Let Women Speak, which uh, is an organic, organically evolved title from some women in Nottingham. Uh, it's not kind of a permission thing, which some people are saying, but it's, it's, we create the space in order to let women speak. Mm -hmm. And did you get to speak or did you have to shout? Some places we got to speak, Loudoun County, which obviously is massively in the news at the moment. We got to speak there. That was great. Um, where else did we speak? Uh, Austin, you know, with five, five armed men that helped us speak <laughs> yeah miami we school girl era i don't even know who rings me at this time of night um miami we got to speak um and then other places we shouted a lot so chicago uh hollywood we spoke um chicago was really close uh tacoma uh that was lots of activists right sort of embedded in between us screaming in our ears washington dc uh new york, new york i didn't get to speak no I, I couldn't even make it no they wouldn't let me in the police wouldn't let me in why so what happens is i well i arrive i arrive dead on when an event starts and the reason i do that is especially if there's opposition they get far too crazy so you can't even really begin and so I sort of arrive after everybody else because I'm relatively recognizable. Um, and and if anyone wants somebody's head, it's going to be mine. Um, so I, I was so late getting to New York because there was so much police presence. There was like 60 officers. Uh, so I couldn't even get near it. And then I went to a, an officer and I said, oh, I'm I'm um, it's my event. You know, I've I've. I've set up this event. Uh, this is my event and I can't get to it. And he said, oh, do you want to get to the event? I was like, yes, please. So he took me around the back of this sort of lorry, not in a weird way, but he um, he took me back <laughs> behind this lorry and he said, oh, you really want to get to the event? I said, yes, please. He went, no, no, hmm. I'm not going to do that. Why would I do that? I was like, because uh, it's, it's my event and I'd like to get to it. He said, no, I'm not risking my men for you. Oh no! Oh. Mm. Go away, basically. R risking? Uh, what would they be risking? Oh, um, I don't know. Me getting through? Maybe the police would have to intervene. I don't know. I mean, obviously they're not security guards, um, but the security guards—I couldn't, couldn't 
wouldn't have got me through anyway. We did have private security. The, the women raised money and hired some private security, but they wouldn't have helped me. Hmm. There was um, there's some interesting uh, reactions uh, that uh, when you did that talk in Austin and there was photos of you and Megan Murphy um, with these mm-hmm. bearded men of mm-hmm. various races too, but there was this dust up about right wing, right wingism in in the so unusual. Uh, they never normally talk about that. Like, what a crazy thing for those left wing feminists to do. So out of character. Um, yeah, that's, that's sarcasm uh, for my audience who can't pick up <laughs> British sarcasm. <laughs> this is what they do. This is what they do every time I do anything. Apparently, there's some sort of right wing element. Um, uh, and in one respect, I wasn't allowed to risk anybody's life. So I, how ridiculous, I didn't have security. And then when I got security, it was the wrong sort of security. Um, apparently right wing guns are not allowed. Uh, I have no idea of the political affiliations of the men, except that I do know the man with dreads down to his backside, um, had been accused by Buzzfeed of being a white supremacist. So, <laughs> really? you know, yeah, <laughs> I, those, like it's in print. Or those on, black you know. white supremacists, man, they're all over America. It's, it's the weirdest it's phenomenon. It's a perfectly mm-hmm. American phenomenon. But do you mm-hmm. understand the dynamic? Because I was looking into, I, I spoke with a Scottish woman who filled me in on the kind of the political nature within British feminism itself, where there's kind of a, it seems like there's a class struggle or at least element mm-hmm. in the left yep. and then the not left thing. Do you understand that? And the origins of that, or, or at least from your perspective, how that intrudes on your work or why that's there as a force? I think there's a, there's so many themes at play. There's one about entryism, like who the hell am I to come along uh, and, hmm. I don't know, do some good work uh, without uh, laboring it over uh, academic feminism and uh, spewing academic feminism and thinking that theory actually applies to many women's lives, which I just don't think it does. And also, I'm a little bit angry about academic academic feminism, because as far as I was concerned, that is where this a lot of this stuff has bred in those classrooms. Uh, Now, not second waivers. So the likes of Dr. Julia Long, uh, Sheila Jeffries, those women, uh, they don't have anything to do with um, gender and separating one's brain from one's body in order to pretend that there's some ethereal nature of being a man or a woman that isn't connected to our bodies. Um, But I'm talking about the rest of them. You know, it it is in those staff rooms and classrooms in universities that this stuff sort of festered and grew and started poisoning everything. Um, However, I, I think for them, I mean, I'm working class. I mean, I'm not, I'm very much not anymore, but I was raised working class. So I don't know when the cutoff is, how much money you have to earn or how big your house has to be or whether or not you go to university. I don't really know where the cutoff is, but I speak like someone who has raised working class, um, very much so. And so- What does that mean? uh, Uh. Well, it means maybe not my accent, but maybe my sort of straightforwardness. Um, you know, and I don't have, I don't <laughs> um, hmm. kind of bow to the uh, extraordinary excellence of academic women or uh, any women, really. I just, I just want to say what I want to do, what I, what I want to say, and I want to do what I want to do, and and I'll do it, uh, and I'll talk to anyone. Um, I don't really understand what the bloody issue is. Well, there's a lot of different issues think, uh, to think about on on that and the dynamics of uh, female typical uh, social dynamics and aggression mm-hmm. and stuff. It's it's a well documented body of psychological research. Like women well, a bit have of different like ostracizing, ways. rubbishing, trashing. Yeah, reputation, yeah. Uh, aggression, kind of stuff like that. So yeah. th- there's that level, which is really interesting because that's a gendered behavior, and so it's just really interesting to see. Is that socialized, Ben, or is that, are we born like? What do you it? think? What do you think? Are I think we're born, born like it. Yeah. 
I think it's legacy memory stuff going on. So I'm just tucking my top. I think it's legacy uh, memory stuff going on. Uh, and I think women have, have, that's our kind of part of our cohesion social group type dynamic stuff. Mm -hmm. So in, in your uh, relationship specifically with feminism, because your project is in line and probably like 80%, or more with uh, the GC theoreticians. Have you had to develop kind of a theory or an analysis? Consciously no, or they, unconsciously? No, I'm a woman and, and those are men. And never the twain shall meet. <laughs> and there's, there's no in between. Hmm. And it's wrong to medically alter children's bodies. Uh, well, I, beyond that, I don't know what theory is needed to just speak really plainly about mm -hmm. this stuff. And so in all of the different issues that you just mentioned, child transition, women's spaces, uh, sex dimorphism, and then the socialization uh, or the social just uh, separation in specific mm -hmm. areas, vulnerable spaces, what's the priority for you? And has that changed over the years? Uh, um, I could say something to you, like the priority is the truth. Uh, that's a bit of a priority. I think there are wide reaching ramifications from lying to children en masse like we are. Um, I think the priority has to be children's bodies because everything else can be undone, but we can't mend those broken bodies at all. Hmm. So that would be, you know, that's the thing I want eradicated immediately. I just want that to stop. I, not another child, not another second of lying to children and saying they can be born in the wrong body. Um, but, you know, I'm a women's rights campaigner. So with just specifically with the child transition, what has changed? We spoke, I think it was three years ago. It's been too long for sure. But over God. the over the intervening years, what has mm -hmm. changed or what do you see? What's the lay of the land and in what direction do you see it going in your country specifically and maybe in America, but specifically in the GB um, I think we've made gains, like quite important gains, that, but they haven't been felt yet. So whilst we had the Maya Forsata victory um, of sorts, um, it hasn't been felt yet. And, and that's because most people in this country, um, not as bad as yours, but most people in this country don't actually have too many decent employment rights. Most people can't afford to go to a tribunal and... Uh, people are still ignoring that ruling in sort of HR. So those things have yet to be really widely felt, but they have happened. And then and you've got- Just for uh, context or the audience, the Maya Forstatter ruling was basically that you, it's legal or it's protected speech to have a gender critical position, which means that a sex based yeah. view of the world is basically kind of, umbrellaed under a religious freedom yeah. kind of thing yes so yeah so i'm no lawyer right so i find that the whole the whole way that was argued really uncomfortable but the, lawyers are about winning cases not making everyone feel happy about the way they're won right hmm. and so i find it uncomfortable that what happened in that so maya worked as a consultant and uh, her contract wasn't renewed on the basis that she had a, a leaflet that was questioning the gender reform, uh, which is our GRA, uh, Gender Recognition Act, and they were gonna make some reforms to make it self ID. So anyone could just say, yes, I am, or whatever, and that would get changed in law. So she um, got fired and then she got supported by um, people like JK Rowling to fight the case um, and had to first argue that it was a okay belief, it was okay, to hold the belief that men are men and women are women. Yeah. And they were sort of upheld as a gender critical belief, which is another thing I have an issue with because I'm not remotely uh, gender critical. I think the word gender should go in the bin and never <laughs> be seen again. I hate the word. I think it's nonsensical rubbish. But you want to um, say you're sex positive because that's a, that's a fraught <laughs> term too. Well, I'm happily married. Um, <laughs> with kids? I'm, <laughs> I am... Uh, I'm just a realist, right? I just like telling the truth and I just like other people being at short sentences. The shorter the sentence, the better, even though I talk far too much. But the if I can say something in just three words, I'd rather do that than seven. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, that's, yeah. So anyway, so we've got Maya Forsater said that was really good. Um, but a lot of people can't afford a tribunal because you need to be off work so you can fight a tribunal. Um, so that might not have the impact that it should, but it is in law. So it's fantastic. Uh, we've had um, the Tavistock has closed. We have yet to see whether or not that is the great news that we all believe it to be. Because now we have the Chelsea and Westminster, which is a large hospital yeah. that's thinking about within the next three years doing 260 phalloplasties a year. <laughs> and part of their team, this is on the, the NHS though, this isn't like some posh private hospital, on the NHS and part of the team is a nurse, a, a viability tissue nurse whose job is to repair wounds that don't heal. That's a person that they know that will need on the team which I don't think there's any other surgeries that we do that aren't absolutely life-saving mm -hmm. that require, um, you know, somebody to repair tissue. It's just awful. Yeah. For not for a cosmetic, this is just new bounds uh, for cosmetic surgery to have that kind of baked in. And, and that opens the question of uh, informed consent, especially with minors, if they can yeah, consent well, I mean, to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mine is, I think that should just be off the table immediately without, I don't even know how it got on the table. Um, but I don't even, I've yet to hear, hear anybody even really try and justify it beyond, oh, they'll kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I, I've heard people on this side of the debate saying, you know, for most children transition is, I'm like, no, for all children, without question, transition is wrong. 100 percent wrong and are you uh of the mind that are you speaking specifically about medical transition or are you talking about social transition all of it i think it's really harmful to allow children to think that their body is not right okay but not like if a boy wants to wear dresses not not on the level of aesthetics but you would stop with the uh, pronouns oh i yeah i'd stop with pronouns and stop pretending that there is any um transition at the end of this lovely rainbow uh you know if if one of my my son used to wear his sister's like fairy dress nobody nobody said you're a pretty girl mm -hmm. but you didn't like slap him around for wearing fairy dresses or anything i was like, like if that. your father comes home he'll kill no <laughs> of course not nobody yeah. cares nobody cares about that stuff well no. not you know my my son's had dolls and push chairs and my, my, my daughter was very girly girly because she was the first out of there were two sons and then my daughter so she was very much like i will identify the hell out of being a girl hmm. because that makes me different to these annoying boys mm -hmm. so the child transition uh stance that's changed the tavistock when we say the tavistock is closing that's a that's not accurate because it was just one part of a really big uh hospital well kind of research oh, institute stuff. yeah but the, yeah, kid, the gender, the gender identity yeah, development stuff yeah. within that which was kind of uh there were some problems about that because it was really close to the adult transition stuff so there was a lot of just interesting exposure between minors and adults at that particular place yeah, but also when they closed that they're what they said originally was that they're just going to kind of disperse it elsewhere so it's not like they're shutting down Gender. Yeah, well, th look, there's two ways of looking at it. It could be that they're gutless and they want to still transition kids, um, which we don't actually. There was sort of a court case uh, with the Kira Bell where we said that we wouldn't do it without um, a little bit more consent uh, under yeah. 16s, um, whatever that means. And I guess it's yet to be tested. But they'll take it out to the regions. Now, what might happen when they take it out to the regions, because everyone is in a very finite budget, is that actually it gets kicked into the long grass every time and they opt for therapy and nothing happens very quickly. It could be that. Or it could be that everybody will have a special budget and that's not been announced yet and it's all a big kind of, we still want to do it because the we're going to, you know, the trans activists won't leave us alone and we believe in it, um, but we're not really going to allow anyone to know really what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Do you, do you have a sense of the political take on it from your parliament or the people who are in charge of the uh, National Health Care Service? If they're 
playing along with it if they are true believers? What what's the political landscape and you know, is it based on politeness? Is it based on because I know mm -hmm. that you just very recently the there was an article published about The Guardian, which is one of your major newspapers where women were not allowed to write about gender. Um, it was given to men and there was even suppression on even bringing up this topic. So that, that seems like there was some sort of political will to avoid or to mm. manage the narrative, but it could have been based on fear or it could have been based on a, a, on an ideological, a positive ideological push for this. Do you have a sense of like, what's going on there? I find it really difficult to believe that any intelligent human being genuinely thinks that surgeries with hugely high failure rates, like just even if you are ideologically captured by this nonsense, the fact that the surgeries are so barbaric and fail and don't, you know, nobody ends up with a vagina who has their penis inverted inside of them. Nobody ends up with a vagina. Nobody ends up with the sort of the flesh and the way that women's body, nobody ends up with that unless you're a woman. Nobody ends up with a working penis that actually feels like a penis. I mean, I don't have one, but I understand they're relatively sensitive and nobody ends up with phalloplasty that is yeah. kind of sensitive. It's got like 20,000 receptors of uh, touch <laughs> on a part of their anatomy it's just ridiculous i don't it, i so no i don't think anyone especially in medicine i think there's lots of people that want to be the first to maybe try and create something close um you know there's plenty of surgeons there's a guy called miles who's in harley street in london which is sort of, sort of famous for posh medicine if you like hmm. and he has he has artwork commissioned of him slicing into breasts it's on the walls of his i mean he's hmm. he's big into his plastic surgery already so i would imagine the money and the delusions of grandeur are really quite intoxicating but you don't think that he believes that what he's doing he really believes that what he's doing is good because I, I it does seem like there's this uh Irish immigrant in Florida who has these TikToks about yeeting the teats. I can't remember her name, but you know, because nobody can read it and say it at the same time because it's not spelt anything like it sounds. It's, it's very Gaelic. It's but, Sieve. Um, I think her name is Sieve. Sieve. But she seems like she's totally on board. It seems like there are people who really do believe in this, right? Have you seen that woman's eyes? Are you telling me she really believes it, or she's not a sociopath? <laughs> I think she's a. I think she's a sociopath. I, I genuinely. I don't think she believes it at all. I think she's. I think she's almost plain old evil. Well, how do you combat something like that with reason, debate, with short sentences? How do you? How do you change the tide on that? And where? Where have your your failures been on on convincing Fine. people of that? Well, <laughs> well, just just see where where have you not taking gains and had to modify your strategy or kind of really see your opposition for what it is and how to change it or weaken it maybe? Well, I think the opposition is a cult. And so I think it's, it's playing the long game. And actually what you need to do when so many people are involved in a cult and it's what less than 5% of the population is involved in this butchery industry, let's say it is even 10% who bought into it completely. You need to convince the ninety percent that it's an issue, and they need to stop it. That's what you need to do, um, which is obviously very difficult. If I'm banned from everywhere, you know, I'm I'm allowed on YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. <laughs> I'm allowed on Facebook as Standing for Women. I have a personal account on there, which is not an activist account, and I'm allowed on Instagram. I am. But I can't even chain, uh, sign a Change.org petition. Can't sell on Teespring. Banned from Patreon. Um, even Give Butter cancelled me. Eventbrite won't advertise my events. Crowdfunding platforms won't allow me to raise money. Um, Twitter, I've been banned since August 2018, and I'm still not back. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been very difficult, but I think, yeah, it's just about waking everybody else up. Because most people, if you had a rational, calm conversation with them, that we were slicing in the United States, we were slicing off the breasts of 13 year old girls. In I mass. think most people would, yeah, would stop, yeah. would want it to stop. 
So what have your tactics been? I mean, it, it's obvious, but I just like to hear from the horse's mouth, uh, not that you are anywhere near a horse, but um, <laughs> what, what, what are the things that have worked? Billboards, those get taken down, t-shirts, like, like slogans, and then events, right? Yeah, I think what, what works is reaching um, more people every time. So uh, the couple of viral things that I've done, uh, that's been quite good for raising awareness. Um, all the merch, which sounds a little bit salesy, but I've sold T-shirts to a quarter of the countries in the known world. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's quite impressive. Um, and stickers. And I get letters from people all the time saying, I thought I was the only one. I felt so alone. And then I saw this sticker or I saw someone wearing one of your T-shirts or... You know, um, a woman stopped me today because I was wearing my T-shirt and then I told her all about it and she said she's going to join. So it's it's sort of, it's this amazing network of women that are just happily uh, building and feeling more confident. So I also get um, communication from people saying that uh, they felt a bit braver. You know, they came to what they came to Speaker's Corner and then in their actual life, they decided to tell their boss that they didn't want to put pronouns in their signature. So it's it's sort of the empowerment of the individual uh, with a view to each of those individuals, like telling 10 people. Um, and the billboards work. And the, I've got a documentary coming out uh, probably before the end of the year because we filmed one in America. So the story of the documentary is what women have had to endure um, because of this ideology. So the fact that we can't speak, the fact that some of us have lost our, lost our children or our jobs, um, or like in Tacoma, a woman's hand got crushed and broken by a trans activist. Um, I couldn't go to Portland because it was the death <laughs> I don't know why you even advertise that you're going to Portland. Do you know anything about Portland? <laughs> Well, I don't know anything. Well, I know Portland, but I thought it was like Brighton. You know, I, I didn't know people actually got away with m literal murder, but I do know. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Hmm. I kind of feel like that's in even that in itself, though, that sort of like we we took some footage of talking to like my son, I don't know if I'll include it because he won't be included in the documentary, but I'm talking to my son and he's like, I don't want you to go. And I, I just think even that is significant. That there is a, There are places in America that are no-go areas for women who want to say women don't have penises. I mean, that's, that's horrendous in a country supposedly that has free speech. Hmm. You, you said that uh, you, you spoke with a woman and she wants to join. Join what? Oh, standingforwomen.com. So we have local groups now. Um, so my organization is Standing for Women. And what we've started doing, and we've got sort of pockets of women all over the world, um, mostly in the UK, but there's Ireland, Australia, Canada, America, and so on. Um, and they will have a local group where they can specifically sort of pivot to local issues uh, with our backing and support, as long as their message is very very clear which is you know we don't use pronouns um i don't want to be authoritarian about it but <laughs> we don't use uh silly pronouns for men and we use kind of correct language because there is a there is a power in just being able to speak right without trying to kind of get your get your little self around certain little cul-de-sacs and, and obstacles in order not to offend someone i just don't see the point so you're in a leadership role. How's that? You're kind of like this little marshal or general. Did you adapt to well, that? I mean, we talked about you being able to vacuum Legos, but like organizing people, <laughs> communicating with people. Yeah, I'm all right at that. I'm quite good at communication. I'm quite a nice person, really. <laughs> um, and I kind of feel... If I were to talk about my leadership as if I could be so immodest, it's a, it's really about leading from behind. It's really about pushing women forward to, to speak themselves, for themselves, because I speak to women. I don't speak for them. I just speak to them. Uh, I think it's a really important distinction 
that when I stand up and speak, I'm speaking for myself, but I hope that I'm uh, it resonates with women so that they know that I'm speaking to them. And then hopefully they can speak for themselves. So that's the point. I was speaking with a friend of mine, um, Alistair Gunn slash uh, Angus Fox. Uh, we were doing a series on him because his health's in a uh, very terminal state. So we're doing a lot of talking and just yesterday and uh we're just kind of speaking about the lay of the land with regard to like kind of the gender topic and the activism topic and there there's just different kinds of people and some people get it and some people don't and you came up as somebody who gets it like you get it and i think what you just said now like you're not speaking for women you're speaking to women and and one of the big themes that i've seen across various different activisms is that these activists they start to claim that they're speaking for this community and that erases their, it erases their self. It erases like their human size. They become bigger than life. They, they, you know, and then the topic itself becomes very toxic and very almost impossible to navigate. It's filled with all this useless po politicking and uh, mm. purity spiraling because everybody has to speak for this group, but mm. who is speaking for that group? So I think that what you just said there is very key. You're speaking to people, not for them. Hmm. And that and also uh, some of the other things I don't do, I don't do guilt by association and I don't accuse other people of guilt by association. I don't do uh, denouncing. Uh, I don't do disassociate, uh, disassociating myself from people. I don't do any of those things. I, I point blank refuse to do any of those things. But that is something that uh, women on the left consistently demand of me that I do these things. And I just think... Like, have you met me? It's it's just not gonna. There's it's just not gonna happen. I I won't do it to the women. I won't condemn a single woman about what she says uh, at one of my events. I just I won't. I might not agree with her, but the whole idea is to let women speak, not let women speak, then chastise them, make them feel really bad, and tell them they're wrong. It's just to let them speak. Hmm. What about men? From your point of view either brazenly or humbly what what's men's role or what would you like from men or what do you see men good at that they could be capable at in this topic generally well i think this this affects everybody but i think it is very uniquely erasing women and not men so i do think when it comes to whose voices should be pushed forward it's not men's it's women's voices um and I think that men have a supporting role. And I, I I know I've always got to dance very finely on this little thin hair of kind of being a bit of a git to men and really thoroughly appreciating what they do. So I think proper blokes, proper masculine, strong men are quite happy just to stand just behind kind of the shoulder of women on this issue. Not kind of not as in, in a subservient sort of way, but in a in a like I'm right behind you. Anything happens, I'm right here. That sort of way, um, elevating women's voices, but again, not in a kind of male feminist way. Mm. <laughs> you know, like the you know like the male feminists, like oh, I really I just so support all women's rights, as they're the most misogynist pieces of. <laughs> work um i've ever come what's across. up with that i was i was speaking with uh, alistair about that too what, what do you think about the male feminist phenomena what's your take ah, on that? have you ever talked to gad sad the canadian no i haven't but i'm familiar with his work so i won't use uh, his full terminology but he um he calls them the cheeky effer yeah so there the are some effort, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, sneaky that's right not cheeky that's a bit of a british word isn't it cheeky um so do you know the phenomenon like they the, the male some male mammals kind of act like women in order to basic because they can't they can't be alpha and get women so they they're real beta males and then they just sneak in <laughs> in order to get the lioness or whichever mammal they so desire so i i think there's a little bit of kind of that i think it's wily and i think i don't think men are often kind of too sneaky because they often don't need to be hmm. they're a little bit more upfront and so even a strategic kind of male who uses that is already a 
dodgy as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. Are you able to sense that? And there, there's kind of a preponderance. I know um, when I'm looking at the gender debate, a lot of it is British and then there's American stuff. And there's just different dynamics in Britain, England, Scotland, all, all those islands that you guys got mm-hmm. over there. And there's just a preponderance of the sneaky effort there. Like there's just like, you know, Billy Bragg, this Aiden, a few Aidens for some reason. Like there's these weird guys who want to police women and yet they call themselves feminists. I don't know if that's a cultural thing or if this is some sort of, you know, boarding school kind of personality that crops up, or maybe I'm just seeing it. I Mm, I, I really don't know. I mean, you've got Charles Clymer who now calls himself Charlotte. He was like a male feminist. Yeah. Wasn't he? Like really. And I think there's been quite a lot of in those sort of uh, media, sort of like vice and those sort of magazines have been quite a toxic supposed male feminist um culture uh i don't know what it is i i mean i i just don't i don't really spend too much time with men that behave like that because they annoy me uh so it i i don't get to work them out too much i just i just know a creepy man when i'm in the company of one what's the tells just for uh, oh, yeah. the, the tell-all, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> what to avoid. So you got, better, so you got a better poker face. Um, I don't think there is. I tell you what, I do. I listen to my instincts, and I sound like I talk about this all the time. But I think our instincts know better than we do, and so I just go with it. And I'm usually right. I'm usually right about everybody on like a first impression, hmm. and then I and then I might rationalise, tell myself I'm being a bit mean. And then I'm always bloody right in the end. And my first impression, I should have trusted. Hmm. So just to expand a little bit on the topic of men. Again, like what can we do? You would like from your point of view for what you're doing, you would like men to be there and support specifically because you, you are very, you're always very direct. You have a very specific thing that you're doing. Let women speak. Adult, mm-hmm. human, female, right? So yeah, and men are allowed speak. to speak at the end. You know, we do oh. say penis havers are allowed to talk at the end. <laughs> well, has there been uh, rousing speeches? Have, has there been memorable men speaking at these? And what's the kind of the content that you've witnessed from the men's point of view? That's really threatening? San Francisco. There was a young gay man, beautiful. He was so beautiful. He was like twenty-one, and he was really struggling within the sort of LGBT culture at university uh, because he was quite pretty Um, but you know he's like six foot four but he was really pretty and um, and really effeminate uh, but also quite masculine so he was sort of uh, he looked like a dancer he's a really lovely young man so he gave a very moving speech about what it's like to be um, you know a pretty gay man and what everybody keeps telling you to transition 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 so i think that was really difficult and for her him to speak up against this and not be you know just not succumb to the pressure um and we also had a father who'd lost one of his kids to this cult uh through a sticky divorce and a woman that was hell-bent on transitioning a child hmm. so yeah we do you know and we also have mr menno who sometimes comes to Hyde Park, uh, you might not be familiar with him, but he's a Dutch gay man who started sort of campaigning against this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's gave, given some speeches. I did have to ask him to stop mentioning his penis in, in every speech. <laughs> <laughs> we, but, um, you, you, if lovely. you define a man by a penis, he's going to define himself as a penis too. Right, fair enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, men are, men are more than welcome. And we've had other, We, I think we had a politician in Miami. And it's fine, but they're just, I just think because this issue is so much that it's women's language that's being erased. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, not, it's not men's spaces. I just think it would be rude if this assault on women's rights wasn't mainly dealt with by women. Well, bringing that up, it's again, there's a preponderance of feminist organizations that are promoting this. There's a lot of women promoting this. What's up with that from your point of view? I, I've thought about this so much. Like, what is it about women? Like, are they, is this some sort of way of pretending to themselves that we've reached 
like some equality utopia. And now they can give away the rights because aren't they kind and lovely? Is it that women use niceness, and I use that in a almost sarcastic way, um, is it that women's currency is niceness? And so pretending to be accepting and tolerant means that you're a really lovely person. Like there are, there's a queen bee element sometimes where women are really nice about other women, but this is what they'll do. So um, my daughter was talking about it actually with the school. So there's a really attractive girl. And so she'll say, who was wearing the best dress or who is the prettiest girl in the class? Now she won't pick pretty girl number two she'll go number five because nobody else is going to agree about number five so she still gets to be the prettiest girl in the class but she starts talking about pretty girl number two hmm. then and everybody agrees she's no longer the prettiest girl in the class right so that's what i think some of this is it's women you can say to a really up pig ugly 56 year old man in a dress that he looks great and isn't his makeup great because he isn't taking anything away from you oh Interesting. So I wonder if it's a bit of that. Huh. And then it's just the currency of being nice. Oh, you're so, oh my gosh, you're so nice and accepting and wonderful and you're tolerant and lovely. And, you know, the worst thing you can be as a woman is disagreeable. Is that true? Well, it's worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, I do think. Maybe you, you shot the moon with that. Women don't like it. So I'm quite good at, I, I, I'm so great at everything, but I'm quite good at taking the mickey out of myself and being self-deprecating, and I don't mind other people doing it. I'll give you an example. When I had my first baby, I put on so much weight. I went from, you won't know the figures, from about six and a half stone to about 12 stone. So I was about 42 kilos. I don't know what it is in pounds. Wait, were you doubled like, in size? I, pr I almost were... doubled in size. Well, I should have been about eight stone, so I was quite underweight. So I went from teeny, teeny, tiny to uh really massive and just uh, yeah did your husband I have to I... roll you around up and down the stairs and... <laughs> <laughs> i also got edema which is when you just kind of fill with water and you can put things on you and then like a coke can and it will leave a dent oh, wow. uh, so uh, it's terrible anyway uh, let's not let's not visualize such a beautiful rotund figure of a pregnant woman um but anyway, I went to a funeral. My son was about four months old, so I was still quite fat. And my friend from school, Christian, oh, I, I went around with mostly boys. And my friend from school, Christian, was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, look, you have to have a seat to take the weight off. And, of course, you're carrying a baby. <laughs> Just like proper. But it's funny, right? So then everyone's laughing. That's kind of women don't often do that. Well, there's a certain amount of currency from shutting people down. If you can tell other people what's funny and what's not funny, what words to use, what n words not to use, what person to hang out with, what person not to hang out with, there's a lot of power and susceptibility of other women um, kind of behaving in that way mm. in order to form a hierarchy or maybe kind of a hive-archy, maybe. Hi, Valky. I like it. Did I mean you won't have followed the tweet, <laughs> the tweets when I was away? But oh my god, they were really. I, I did a thing in Brighton, and uh, the attacks were relentless for weeks from women. Because yeah, because two people turned like the TRAs turned up to. Uh, we got a smoke bomb thrown at us, and um, we had police presence and all this stuff. But. Uh, the rabid, obsessive women who spend most of their days <laughs> talking about me went absolutely bonkers about me daring to go to Brighton without asking permission if I could go to Brighton, without talking to local feminists uh, about whether or not I could go to Brighton. And then I turn up and two people they don't like filmed the event and put it on their own channel. Um... And they were from an organization called Hearts of Oak, which these women characterize as far right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. one of them is in the House of Lords. I don't know whether you, you are allowed to be in the House of Lords and be so-called far right, but they also refuse to say what is far right. You know, I think of far right as, as kind of the National Front um, when I was like 
1970s 80s so 1980s when i was aware of these people with skinheads who genuinely did want to just you know they saw anybody who was black or asian they would have just kicked their head in if they could have that's what i think of as far right not a couple of people who maybe have uh views that we can't take continue to take thousands upon thousands of immigrants into the country right which which i think is a reasonable point of view but as soon as you even say that um apparently you're also far right mm-hmm. yeah what's up with brighton is that a very what's specific about it's, like, it's like our portland without guns oh okay very uh, very woke so you just have like Molotov a... cocktails and antifa no is there antifa no out no, there? no no uh yeah well they're they are antifa but they're like 19. <laughs> yeah they're like trans rights and women's rights trans trans rights they're all a bit weak <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a meal. I'm a, I'm a vegan. Trans rights. And it's like trans rights. What, what do we do when turfs attack? Fight back. And you're like, you couldn't fight your way out of a paper bag. <laughs> oh no. Was it? Did that change? Was there a radicalization recently in your country? Like there was in Portland. Portland was this beatific place where people went to retire when they were twenty. To to quote. Portlandia, right? Was Brighton kind of like this hipster paradise? And then has there been like a kind of a turn in your politics like there has been in America? Well, there's been a more polarizing sort of turn in politics, I guess. Um, And we have a conservative government, which is about as far right as we go, um, which is still to the left of your Democrats or was until Biden. and yeah, so no, I like Brighton is is uh, just sort of gay and happy and uh, lovely rainbows until rainbows meant some sort of hmm. uh, fascistic <laughs> controlled thought experiment. Uh, but yeah, just a really great place, great clubs, gay culture, um, and posh people who want to live both near the sea and London. So it's, you know, big, expensive house prices and so on. Um, so I don't know. Is there a u- university there? Is there? Yeah, there's Sussex, which is where Kathleen Stock got bullied out of. Yeah. And there's also Brighton Uni. So there's two. Okay. Okay. So mm-hmm. in, in my adventures into, in my jer- uh, gender journey, oh, yeah. I've, I've spoken with a lot of people. I've spoken with detransitioners, trans trans people, um, psychologists, and uh, political activists like you. And you, you're doing kind of political activism in a very specific way, very straightforward. But it does overlap with the psychological aspect. And we've kind of spoken about the psychology of, you know, group dynamics and stuff like that. But with regard to young women getting swept up or, or thinking of themselves or wanting to think of themselves as male... Have you done much out, outreach to them specifically, or do you have any takes on that? I don't feel I'm well equipped to deal with people that have um, those sorts of issues. I, I know that I reach some of these women. Um, I, in fact, I met one at Speaker's Corner who had a full beard and um, had her breast removed. She was about 24, so she'd been transitioning since she was 17. She was lovely. And she said, I challenged myself to watch one of your videos because I thought you were full of it. And she said, and and then just after one video, I want to detransition um, because I couldn't argue with the thing you said. Okay. Uh, so I think it might have been a trigonometry or something. I don't know. I don't think it was like a, hey, buy some merch. I don't think it was one of those videos. Um and I just said to look, take it really slowly, go and talk to a doctor about slowly withdrawing from testosterone because it might be the thing that makes you feel okay. Um, and it, it won't in the long term, it will just ravage your body. But um, I would advise you to take it, to think about this very, very seriously because you only want to do this once. Um, and she's like, oh, I'm not ready to shave my beard off and I don't think I look feminine. I was like, you're about five two. You've got teeny tiny hands and pretty eyes. I was like, you can definitely pass as the sex that you are. Mm-hmm. But you know, obviously, her face is masculinized, and um, just 
the war on breasts the like just even that it is it's so i don't know where it comes from i don't know whether women have always felt like this i do know that uh, if we look at people like Amanda Jane Blakemore or Blackmore, who studies, um, so we always thought that the biggest life change for anybody is like naught to three, and it's not. It's puberty uh, that has the most dramatic changes that that we ever go through. More than learning language or learning to see or recognise faces, it's puberty that has the most monumental change. And two things happened, especially for girls, but I would imagine it was boys to a lesser degree, is that. Um, peer group so wanting to be accepted by your peers is overwhelming which is why you're more likely to die and get hit by a car if you're with your friends and if you're on your own because you will like more likely to take more risk it's why kids smoke it's why you that you really need to fit in with your group and the other thing is you feel really the height of embarrassment and what i think the imperative there for evolutionary biology and i've got no evidence for this it just yeah. feels right is that you want to be away from your parents so you're not procreating with your parents. So you're not going to have sex with your parents. Um, so you want to push away from that family dynamic and you push into your friends. And the embarrassment stuff is is all to do with um, safety and uh, so on. Um, did I lose you? I'm here. Do you need, do you need to answer that? No. Do you need to take a call? No, because I have told my son under, under no circumstances, uh, call me uh, because he's safe somewhere. Uh, and I've said he needs to call his brothers if he needs anything. He'll learn eventually. Yeah, he's only 14. It's, you know, he's... <laughs> anyway, so that's what I That's what I think. I think it's sort of, it's it's an evolutionary purpose of of moving away from your family and into sort of peers and then obviously... Uh, procreating eventually with people <laughs> your own age, but I have no evidence for that. It just feels that hmm. that would might be an explanation. Yeah, the the um, there is a crossover here. I don't know how um, intentional or you are or could be about this, but you do present you project the image of a woman. Like you're you're you've branded yourself very like recognizably woman and strong woman would be the modifier to that. Right. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way you could be living by example, uh, showing young women a path towards strength. And that's what you said. You've been doing uh, what you've been doing intentionally on a political level is to listen and speak to and listen and speak to and, and do that. The actual empowering thing of bringing mm -hmm. people out. So there's the teen girls and then there's the parents and there's a lot of parent support stuff going on in other corners. W what has been your, your thoughts and your exposure with working with parents who maybe have a kid that is toying with a trans identity or has been lost by a trans identity? Have you, um, how do you approach that? And what have you learned about that? What have I learned? I've learned that uh, a lot of parents, um, I think it's different in the UK and the US, right? I think in the US, it's so difficult to avoid it if your kid has been switched by this because there is no help. Um, and so <sighs> there's a little bit of me that wonders if, if some parents aren't... Um, collectively infantile and aren't the parents and adults in their own house. Now, I don't mean that I've necessarily met an abundance of them, but it's just a feeling I get with, like America's been doing time out rather than saying no to kids. have been doing time out a really long time. And I think they finally found that it doesn't work, number one. But it, all, it kind of feels like a deferring the role of a parent because... You can just say no to kids, right? You can just say, no, don't do that, or there will be consequences. Not, okay, time out. Like, you just have to be quite authoritarian with children because that's what mm. they require. 
They need no rigid, no sort of flimsy boundaries that they can push. They feel safe with boundaries. So um, I'm not saying I get it all the right all the time, although I do have nice children, although apparently they don't listen to the instruction, <laughs> which is don't phone me. <laughs> so Clearly, I don't get it right all the time. Uh, but I, I think what I've learned from uh, parents is that in, in the United States especially, it, you're doomed really once your kid has switched to this you have to be you have to have the means to maybe move halfway across a country and cut off all communication as soon as they touch this stuff mm -hmm. uh because schools are so captured uh horrendous like horrendous what is going on with schools um which obviously again goes back to academic feminism and other sorts of activism in universities because the teachers are all captured mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about America traveling through it? What did you did you get a sense? Are we different from one place to another? Or? Oh my god! Yeah, I could tell by the Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> high friendly people were in the Starbucks. <laughs> that was one of my my um, documentary guy and me went for coffee one morning in Philadelphia, and I was like, "Oh, this sounds totally different vibe <laughs> than every than the other places I've been." <laughs> Uh, really like nonchalant, not interested in actually. Whereas everyone else, hi, take a seat. Let me bring it over. What would you like? <laughs> and um, the documentary film by guy was from, um, I want to say Sacramento. So he was really laid back. So it was like, yeah, I appreciate it. You know, so say to someone, she'd say, oh, I'm giving you too many choices. Because goes, no, it's fine. I appreciate it. There's a lot of appreciating and hmm. nice words and encouraging stuff. Uh but I learned that you don't actually really have the right to free speech because you don't have the right to be heard. So there's, it's absolutely pointless. In, in what way? Have like heckler's well, if you're veto? The, is that what you're saying? Yeah. But the heckler's veto can drown you out completely and be sirens in your ears. And as long as they don't punch you in the face, um, you know, so you, you don't have a right to speak at all because uh, you don't have a right to be heard. And the heckler's veto would be fine if it was you get to speak, <laughs> then they get to speak. Or you get to speak and four metres across the way, they get to speak. So they get to oppose you, but they don't get to talk so that you can't be heard. And these people, there's one guy, he turned up with, I just used my sock box, <laughs> my merchandise box, two blocks of wood like this, banging them together. He was like 40 and I was like, have you really, have you really come out to bang two pieces of wood together? Like, you're a fully grown man. I was like, that's ridiculous. And then I made some smutty kind of, I expect that's the closest you ever get to wood comment. Because <laughs> uh, I'm nothing but hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I amuse myself. Did you get to mainly. do any media when you were out uh, in America? I did. I did Fox and Friends at like... Four or five in in the morning. Oh wow! Uh, I did Sebastian Gorka, a friend of the right. Um, do you know him? Yeah. No. Uh, well, he was he was on Trump's kind of staff, um, but he's a really lovely man. He's from England. Uh, and what else did I do? Uh, no, I did. I think I know who you're talking about. Newsmax. Listen to him. Last night, how was Fox and Friends? Was that weird? Yeah, Were they great. Weird? Yeah. Do you, no, do you enjoy I, these media things when you get yes. to be on TV? Mm. You've really perfected your your oh, that you get you get your sound bite and you know how to you don't read the room you know how to command the room you like it the room is mine yeah I don't plan it either <laughs> I I I do I I really don't plan like what little sound bitey things are going to come out of my mouth but I guess I'm relatively well rehearsed because I speak five nights a week on my channel. Um, I can just talk. I mean, about probably most issues, but about this issue, I can just talk and talk and talk. And so I've learned not to give short answers on television. Otherwise, you, you might not get the microphone back. Uh, you're seeding time, so you kind of have to... Uh, not gerrymander. Uh, what's it called? Um, thing where the politician talks Filibuster. Forever. Filibuster, yeah. Mm -mm. I'm quite good at it. Ask my kids. They love it. <laughs> and there, 
I heard a rumor and you confirmed it that you might be entering into politics. Mm. I am. I was going to go that? against Eddie Izzard. Yeah. Uh, what Are you saying why or when? No, what, what's that about? I guess, yeah, why, but what is that about? And how are you going to, do you perceive yourself reorganizing how you approach getting votes rather than getting out the word, right? No, I don't. I'm not going to change. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to change. Uh, I will keep speaking like this. Um, so I was going to go against Eddie Izzard. So Eddie Izzard is a prosthetic breast wearing man who now calls himself a woman. He's like a Hollywood star. He was a really, really funny, really funny stand up. And then I remember him, like maybe his fifth stand up. He then wore like a Basque and fake breasts and knee high boots. And he'd gone a little bit off message from these aren't men's, these aren't women's clothes, they're my clothes. Um, and called himself like a, um, a male lesbian, like for a joke uh and now he's just been really drawn in um by his compulsion of autogynophilia which i don't think he can fight and he was in a documentary a long time ago he lost his mother as a little boy in his formative years and sort of talks about constantly trying to find her in everything which i think probably is the driver for his fetish and i don't want to psycho you know I, i'm just saying this is this is what i think from just a layman's point of view um but I was going to go against him because I think it's absolutely, frankly, offensive that there is a man who is taken seriously, who wears fake breasts um, and calls himself a woman and uh, also sort of copied my look. Like he's got short blonde peroxide hair <laughs> and wears quite a lot of makeup. Maybe but, you're the um, mama he's been looking for everywhere. Oh, I that would be so nice. I'm younger than him. Um, so anyway, so I, I was going to go against him and he didn't get selected. So I thought, right, OK, I'll run against the leader of the Labour Party because they have betrayed women. They've said the most stupid things like um, on a news programme, sensible news programme. He was uh, and he's an ex kind of he was head of all law, criminal law and lawyers. Um, and and the uh, presenter said to him, uh, is it wrong to say that only women have a cervix. And he said, it shouldn't be said. Hmm. It's the wrong thing to say. So he has said some stupid things. And I think the reason I go against him and not a Tory is the Tory leader has actually said that he does know what a woman is. Um, but the idea is to push this conversation. Like that's about it. That's everything that I do is about pushing the conversation. So everybody knows what's going on. And perhaps it will turn out that I am a terrible human and I'm completely wrong about this. And all the population will know about it and they will come to a consensus and it will, it will make me irrelevant. Um, but I don't think that is the case at all. I think that uh, most people have no idea what's going on. And so it also means I'm allowed, um, it would be illegal for people not to put billboards up of mine. Oh. Because of um, kind of political bias. So they have to allow me to advertise my political campaigning, <laughs> which means I get to put that stuff back up again. Um, and, I, you know, I just get to force a conversation. It doesn't yeah. even have to be... If I can ask questions of the the uh, leader of the Labour Party, and if he is forced to answer questions about me, which I think he probably will, then there's no stopping every single MP going for a seat, which is all of them in a general election, being asked the exact same questions. And it will be impossible for them to be taken seriously whilst pretending that they think women have penises. What's the uh, what's the setup then for this? I, I'm not really I don't really understand your guys's political machinery. So when would the election be, and what's the run up to that? 2024, and, most likely May 2024, but it can be up until December 2024 because we have five year terms. Oh, okay. And an MP, what what are you running for? What's the position? And a member of Parliament, which is the House of Commons. So that's the elected part of our two houses then we have the house of lords which is unelected so you have people that are um peers by birthright there's only a few of those left and that's not continuing or they get uh put in by um the current government but not in a politically biased way but might be recognition for something that you've done hmm. and uh, and the MP is by region. Is this like a county? I guess yeah. you guys are running 
Uh, well, it's called a constituency, and it won't just be counties. It will be um, so in London. You've probably got about twenty different MPs for different areas of London. Um, I, yeah, I'm on the very edge of my constituency, so that might run for about twenty miles. Uh, so it just it just so it's, it's equivalent to a up. congressional district then in, yes. in in American terms. Okay, and then the person that you'd be running against is within your clade, your district. Yes. Okay. So you don't have to live there. So I, as long oh. as there's enough women that will nominate me i don't have to live there because it's a he's part of um st pancras which is the train station that go <laughs> part of st pancras st pancras st pancras oh okay not not creus but st pancras is the station that goes to europe so he's um holborn and st pancras okay and you said you need enough women you don't don't you want men too or is this, or is the labor mostly women anyways? Why do you bring that up? It's anyone. I don't okay. know why I said yeah. women. Okay. Uh, probably because I know that there are women that are going to nominate me in order for me to actually be an independent. Okay. And um, then how does the funding work for you guys? Is, do you guys get like a stipend from the government or do you have to raise that yourself? You raise it yourself, but uh, there are ele there are rules about how much you can raise. Um. Okay. I intend to raise quite a lot. I just well, want to absolutely flood the whole pigging area with um, billboards. Wow. Okay. And when when are you going to start that? When are you? I guess you kind of declared already, but when does it start in I earnest? Yeah. So I've got um, a website called theotherparty.co.uk. That was quite funny. That you like who are you voting for? Labour. Conservative, no, the other party. Um, so, <laughs> just great. Uh, we may change that before uh, we actually start campaigning. But um, next year, I've got uh, Newcastle, Scotland, um, two dates in London. Then I'm going to Australia for three and a half weeks to do a tour and documentary in Australia uh, and also across to New Zealand. Then I'm going to go and do the same in Canada. So I'm back for a couple of weeks and I'll go to Canada. And then when I come back, I'll have about a year to campaign okay. uh, towards the general election. It's not like the States where as soon as you're sort of, as soon as the midterms, you're then like campaigning right the way through. We don't have quite so much. And we, we, we don't campaign in the yeah. yeah, we don't campaign in the same way as you either. I did love that about the US. Like the, it's like, unlike my opponent, I've never been in jail, <laughs> <laughs> or I've never been accused of fraud. <laughs> so it's like real negative campaigning. Um, but I might bring a little. I, I, I foresee me putting a billboard up with like. Me, my face and the dictionary definition of the word woman and then Keir Starmer and the stupid things that he said about women. Hmm. Um, just, I, I don't think, I, you know, I don't necessarily think I'll win. Uh, this is not about that. This is, again, is about promoting the, um, promoting this whole idea, allowing people to talk about, uh, telling people what's going on in their kids' schools. Um, telling people that some of you know a large chunk of NHS money is going to make fake penises for women. It's um, it's that. Oh, but your legal problems. How many times have you been arrested now? Oh, I'm on my I'm on my fifth round with the police right now. Okay, cool. I've only been arrested once. I've had twice. I've been interviewed under caution about tweets and something on YouTube. Uh, that was back in 2018. Um, and then, was it 2018, 2019? And then uh, during lockdown, I got arrested for having a political meeting outside uh, to break lockdown, even though that was one of the things that you could do if it was political, but the police turned up like two massive police fans and I live streamed the whole arrest. So that was quite good because he didn't realize that my phone was on. So it just got put on the floor. So then you could just hear them going, are you going to tell us who you are? <laughs> Even though they knew who I was, are you going to tell us who you are now? Like no comment. Um, so this is, you know, was this was during the, with... like the Black Lives Matter uh, madness? Uh, yeah, so guess... they were allowed yeah. okay. to march. Yeah. Um, but women aren't political apparently. Um, and then I had the police at my door a few months ago to say that I'd been untoward about paedophiles. What was that about? Why would you be untoward? What does being untoward 
mean specifically in your land? Like uh, unkind, kind of uh, suggestive, not nice. But what it really was is somebody had reported me for saying that um, men who dress as women and use spaces where children, little girls are present, are pedophiles, right? So I'd said that. And I think the police just, because I I was quite... Um, why why are you wasting my time? Because I was very much like that about them. He was quite flustered. So he's like, oh, good on to order about paedophiles. I was like, well, surely out of all the people in the world, <laughs> the people I can be untoward about are paedophiles. He was like, oh, I don't want to argue. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> I was like, I just felt like going, did you get the short straw? All the others were in the office like, you, you go, send him. Um, and then I, I recorded... So I got a phone call from a police officer and I was picking up my kids. I was like, look, I'm driving. Can you call me at six? And so I let her call me and I put it out on YouTube. About what was the recording? Oh, um, hate speech at my Brighton rally. Okay. And what what's hate so, speech mean? Uh, are they able to define that for you? No, they couldn't tell me what I'd said. They couldn't tell me who I was. They said it was about sexual orientation as well, which I thought was interesting because... Uh, it won't it won't be anything near that. Um, I mean, it won't be anyway. And I said, well, look, as I understand it, hate has to be attached to an actual crime. So what's the crime? Um, and she was like, yeah, that's what we need to, to come in for. They, they basically want me to go in so that I then say something stupid in an interview and they can offer me a caution, which is not going to happen. So I will wait to be arrested. But they've referred it to the Crown Prosecution Service to see if they can arrest me. They really mm. want you in mm. to offer they you a really caution. Well. Everything sounds like some sort of weird, like dressed up BDSM, like covert <laughs> operation here. <laughs> offer you is. a caution. What does that really? Well, when you get a caution, it kind of gets recorded as that you've, it's like pleading guilty to something without going to court. So it could prevent me from getting in the US, for example. So it, I'm not taking a caution. I'll go to court and I will misgender the hell out of everybody that, wants me not to um that is what i intend to do and let's just again push this out into the open to its logical conclusion because most women by the time they get to court they do adhere to this nonsensical idea that you can call men she and i just i'm not gonna do it would so, that uh being offered a caution uh, would that um disrupt your plans for are you allowed to run for political office if you've been offered a caution oh i don't know but it's world domination i'm heading for so <laughs> 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 it might ruin that speaking about uh, the police is there any motion toward police reform because the stuff that your uh, bobbies are doing is just just off the reservation which is a bad term but Still, it's just, it's just. It's all right. Bobby's not good either. Because uh, we're only, I'm only 48. <laughs> oh, is that Bobby an oldie, like, old timey thing? It's term? a really old thing. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, no. Tory, Tory, but not Bobby. Okay. Like all these terms. I don't know what, what's a truck and what's a maggot. Lorry. Yeah. Lorry. Lorry. Not Lorry. 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 Yeah. Lorry. Lorry. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> but is there Fine. any. Is there any reform going on with that, with this hate speech no. baloney? No. And does the public, is the public okay with this? No, but again, they, d they don't really know. Like The Guardian, um, so if you just watch TV, you're not going to see any of it. Uh, the trans activists did this thing called No Debate. And what that means on our television, because our state... Anything with state money, so whether it's ITV, that like the main terrest old-fashioned terrestrial channels, um, they have to be unbiased and non-partisan. So they have to always have two sides of the debate. So if one side won't turn up, they can't have the debate. So trans activists don't turn up. Therefore, oh. they don't have the debate on the BBC or ITV. And that means that people don't get to hear what's happening. Um, and also there's quite a lot of sort of LGBT probably not that many L, but LGBT in the BBC and ITV and media in general. So they don't talk about what's happening to women. Um, and they would argue that it's a clash of rights as opposed to it's a stealing, it's a th theft of women's rights. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah it, it's uh if you read then if you go online you might read the daily mail but only if you're a certain sort of person you might read the daily mail or you'd have a sneaky read of the daily mail because i think most people read it really um but the left-leaning stuff they've not been covering this issue really at all hmm. and um so how would people know it's it's just it's crazy it's it's a really interesting um in relief you get to see where power is just with one this one issue and then you have to wonder about a lot of other issues when you look at this one issue it's like what are they not telling us we everybody knows that this thing is going on crime or whatever it is but the media actually is has all the power because if the media mm. doesn't report on anything then the uh then the politicians don't have to talk about it and then the police can go ahead and deal with it any which way as long as the media is not doing the job yeah. of of platforming the truth or very carefully navigating that truth and so you really do see that in our so-called democracies right now the centers mm. of power the new york times the guardian the media and and politicians basically serve the you know the media too because if they're on the bad side of the media then they're just going to get a bunch of press and then the then, then the public is going to you know do what the public does so yeah. far as they're allowed so it's really yeah you can control a population far more with what you don't tell them than the what you do um i've got a friend who works at ofcom which is our sort of um governing body over what goes out into uh people's anywhere so everything everything communication is is governed by them and she does a lot of this she does a lot of work in like what isn't being told she had no idea about the no debate i was like yeah the reason that we don't get on the bbc is because the trans activists won't debate and you have impartiality so therefore you've made it impossible for women to speak whereas actually what i think you should do is you try every effort to get somebody and actually if you get turned down by 10 people you can say right we invited these people to come and debate and so you know chair you can know chair people and and then you'll just have someone set sat across an empty chair and that'll teach them especially when there's like high earning um lobby groups mm -hmm. that just seems completely nonsensical that uh they would be allowed to have government money to advocate for whatever it is and then they could not turn up on the government kind of state uh television yeah sorry to uh, compose this like kind of like more of a normal interview that I that I like where I'm asking you questions and you're responding but right. kind of sort of final question um, you said that the best way to control people is to not tell them things hmm. what are you not telling us Kelly Jenkins? <laughs> <laughs> well I don't want to control anyone I want oh, them okay. to uh, just understand what's going on and control themselves yeah uh, so yeah I mean, maybe there's lots of things I don't tell myself because I'm quite in control. Hmm. What was the best part of the American journey? Or oh my God, I'm going to sound. I'm going to sound weird. I'm going to tell you what happened to me in America, and uh, I'm forever changed. And um, so I've been doing this quite a long time, and I get really nice things said to, to me all the time about the, the changes I've made to somebody's life or save their daughter and often I sort of take those things and I think that that person is telling me more about themselves than they are about me because you can't possibly you can't possibly take the credit for somebody changing but it's happened to me an awful lot um, but I also think if I take the sort of adoration with the same seriousness as I take the hate then I can stay pretty balanced um and I I just knew I was doing this thing and isn't it fun and and I get and tell people this stuff and and you know it's it's good because I can say these things that other people can't say and I'm I'm, I'm it doesn't take courage or bravery or anything I just I can just do it you know bravery would be wearing a bikini right so for me uh maybe not for you ben uh but for me um thanks for so, the image so, <laughs> so I, I just don't think of myself as particularly brave it's something that i've always done i'm i'm fine about talking to strangers and talking on stages and all that sort of stuff and then i was in this is so weird this is genuinely true but very very weird so i was in chicago 
and um, somebody's just knocked my microphone off and I'm sort of, so I can't talk to my documentary guy and he's somewhere over there and I can just sort of see uh, the camera and where he is. And then I've got women behind me being pushed and screamed at by trans activists. And there's this serene, beautiful young woman with a thought criminal t-shirt on and she's just standing there serene. And it's, it's like this mob of screaming and shouting and swearing and like Posey Parker's a Nazi and a white supremacist and screaming at me and everything just goes muffled and slow and it's <laughs> it's like I've just I've like slowed everything down and it's like something out of a movie and I just look around <laughs> like this and I was like I think I've just got to do this like I, I just feel like I have to do this. And I say this thing on my channel all the time, like, if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? And it just, I, I, felt, I felt different. I'm not even spiritual, right? <laughs> I don't believe in God. I'm not spiritual. And I just felt, I just felt like completely different here, as if the space between my sternum and my spine suddenly just lifted and was light and is just weird and it's weird and I am completely I'm very light about this all now I feel I just feel like a different I feel completely different so that was the hmm. kind of defining moment of the trip what do you mean I kind of different. I felt like I stepped into my own shoes huh and before then you were not quite there or? I don't know. I, I, all I can tell you is that I'm changed. I can't tell you what was before. Hmm. I can just tell you I feel differently, but I can't tell you how I was feeling in the, in the seconds beforehand or even months beforehand. But there's been plenty of time where I think I, I didn't take myself very seriously. I sort of thought that this is a bit of a hobby and I'm just selling T-shirts. And now I actually think... I think I have to do this. I, I think I've got the next couple of years of, I absolutely have to do this. I cannot, I cannot look another woman in the face whose kids lost to this cult, but I couldn't anyway. I couldn't, I, I would have said that a year ago or two years ago or for as soon as I knew it was happening, I could say that. But, but I think there's a difference between saying I, I can't and, and kind of like, I can't and therefore it will not. And I, I kind of feel like I'm at that <laughs> that part of this thing. Who would have thought? <laughs> what, selling a few T-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I mean, I did theology, right? So it was like a bit of a, it's like an epiphany, road to Damascus kind of any theological reference you want to come up with but it was it was really quite profound hmm. and very very real and weird <laughs> yeah there's there's a there's a life inside of life and every once in a while we get to see that or be a part of it and being active is the best way um to become yourself and be yourself and stuff so those little tiny moments like that I mean, I know it's a part of your journey, but that's a part of the human experience that this is kind of like a, a moment of grace where we get to, we get to be seen, uh, or we get to see what's inside of us in a way, or, or what we are and what we're doing really lines up. It's a blessed mm. thing, whether you want to put it in a theological context or not, but. It does really, it, like I've met a few people since I've got back who know me quite well, who were like, oh, he's you seem quite different. Like not even, nobody can tell me what. In fact, a couple of people have said, you seem lighter, <laughs> which I have lost a bit of weight. But, um, you know, j just genuinely, I, I, I feel very easy about all of this. And hopeful. Hmm. Hopeful. So you think that it's going to change? I don't think. I just don't think. 
lies uh, can stick around for too long. And I think it is, I think it's lies and deceit and deception. And I think there's going to be a lot of people that have been truly injured and ruined. Uh, and I don't mean everybody who transitions is, you know, everybody uh, has to be seen as ruined. I just, I just think our bodies are really magical, right? We, like, as adults, we get to experience incredible things with our bodies, um, both sort of intimately and uh, just walking about this world and seeing it and experiencing it and to dismantle a body uh, on the whim of something that will never, ever be achieved is just monstrous. Um, but also the, the the legacy of lies on these kids in schools, pretending that they can't see what they can see in front of them, losing some of our language. I think that will take a while to undo, but it will be undone because there's never been a moment in history where this sort of level of lie has, has lasted. Yeah, has lasted. I thought you were going to say... Uh has been perpetuated but oh no thankfully i don't have to come up with examples of that but it is a house of cards it's just it's interesting because every like few months people are like oh it's finally over but like no it's it's really deep it's a really deep thing yeah and i wonder what the impact will be on a generation like this current generation in schools who haven't been able to stand firmly on the solid kind of truth. I wonder what that does to the human psyche, especially in mass, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. But you guys are good at that. You've had the opioid crisis, a bit few lobotomies, then, you know. Oh, yeah, it happens. It's, it's a generational thing. Every 20 years we have a panic about something. Or a world war. This is better than a world war, I guess, but we'll see. Well, at least we all know a war is bloody evil. Um, hmm. It's at least honest. Well, maybe it actually isn't honest at all. But, um, hmm. you know, I always think um, my most screwed up friends are from parents who never shouted. But were perpetually disappointed. Like that Ouch. does, that's so much worse than your parents who shout at you where you just think, oh, oh shouting at me. Like that's a horrible thing to do. We can all acknowledge that that's not a nice thing to do. But the kind of the the nasty, disappointing hmm. kind of thing. They're my most screwed up friends. Hmm. My parents like that. And so e I e shout at my kids. Yeah. <laughs> you don't seem that you're all that taken with, um, I guess, I want to say cleverness, but I think there's a good cleverness, but underhandedness. Uh, propriety that's been weaponized in a way you don't have time for that and you don't even think it's good no because no i think no i don't think it's good i think um i just i always think just speak clearly truthfully effectively honestly kind of I just get on better like that. I think it's funnier as well. I think, you know, mm. there's a there's a wit and a humor in just being straightforward that you can't have if you're... Oh, some of these women that take themselves so seriously and I, just, I can just say, it's a man, he was born with a penis. It's a man, it's a man. XX chromosome, it, it, XY chromosome, it's a man. That's all, that's... That's the bloody argument, right? He's not coming in because he's a man. Not, uh, you know, we have layers of what we are and, uh, you know, maybe he doesn't behave and how he feels and blah, 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 blah. It's no, it's, it's, it's a man. <laughs> That's it. It's not complicated. We all know what men are. We all know what they're capable of. Most of us know very, very nice men. And those nice men will tell you that they don't want men in our spaces. And I trust those men every day of the week. You you brought this up earlier, but you said that you, 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 your message is really simple, but you're talking about it all the time. Like you're on the radio all the time. You're you're doing your show. How often is your show going? Your YouTube? It's five days a week. Five days a week for a couple hours. You just get no, like a God, bottle no. of nog and and you just go in <laughs> through the news reports or something. I just do ten or fifteen minutes. I usually oh, sort okay. of respond to something that's happened. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. just checking in with people really, and then yeah. I do a turf talk Tuesday, which is a phone in. Um, 
that we have free phone numbers in New Zealand, uh, Canada, Australia, UK, uh, America. Turf Talk Tuesdays. Talk. What's that? What's that about? What do you guys cover? Just a phone-in show. So people phone into my channel and have a chat hmm. and tell me their stuff. And hmm. yeah, wow, it's nice. Hmm. And then uh, what about people uh, wanting to support you in other ways? Where is your merch found? Where is your, uh, your, your other websites and stuff? A long list. So at standingforwomen.com, at the moment, we are asking for funding for documentaries and tours. Um, so so you can uh, go there. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but let, could you just plug your documentary? And like, do you have a series? What's the plan for this? How, how many are going to do, you think? And, and when's well, the first one coming out? And, First one should be out before the end of the year. So my documentary man is uh, busy editing as we speak. Um, it's going to be great. I've seen some of the footage. I did say to him, my ears are in a funny place. He's like, there's nothing we can do about that. <laughs> I was like, I never knew my ears were in a funny place. And I, he was like, I'm going to do a week for this. And then I've got some time to do this. And I was like, mm, how much have you got for Photoshop? Because uh, that you'll need about a week, but he, apparently he's not going to do any. So it's going to be all no lighting and and truth and truth and reality about my the way I look. And is this um, going to be put up on your YouTube and your other video yeah, channels? Yeah, okay. and then people can cut it. And and what I want people to do is not just watch it. I want them to clip bits of it. I want it to be shared. I want them to use it to peak anybody that they think is ripe. Um, and then you can go to adulthumanfemale.store for the UK uh, merch. For the US, it's uh, adulthumanfemale.us. And for Europe, it's adulthumanfemale.shop. Oh, okay. And uh, standing for women or let women speak? Let women speak is your... Standing for women is my organization. Standing for women, yeah. But let women speak let is women. kind of... Yeah, okay. that's the tool. Okay. Standing for there's a lot of people with a lot of organizations. All of the links are going to be down in the description, regardless. Thanks. But I just wanted you to say it out loud because that's the proper thing to do on a podcast. But mm -hmm. KG KGK, you're phenomenal. I just I have to praise you. I don't like praising people. It's embarrassing and stuff. But you just you are you have something and you're doing great work. And it's always great to catch up with you. So I just want to give you total encouragement and uh, my support and my my adoration because you're just like you're this shooting star without the disintegration and the the crater but we'll see well you never know we'll see <laughs> yeah. thank you so much it was a real joy to see you again